I firmly believe that they are living entities in and of themselves that mm-hmm. survive in a dimension we just cannot see or feel, mm-hmm. and they come to us in dreams. And it's my path in this life to give these stories a voice so they can continue to survive. I mean, with an oral tradition, that's how our stories have lived for, you know, 15,000 years or better. While Gluskomba, whose name means he who made himself, was the first of the two-leggeds to walk upon the earth. He was here before the human beings were here. Because he made himself, and Creator was quite all impressed with that, because he made himself from the leftovers of what Creator was making the world from, Mm -hmm. and as he brushed the dust off his hands, that dust had the gift of life from Creator's hands still in it, and that life couldn't be negated, and everything kind of swirled and twisted around and this being was formed and became Gluskomba. So as Creator went off to do other Creator things, um, he left Gluskomba here on this earth to oversee the planet, to um, finish and refine Creator's work, to create more plants and animals as needed, and to teach the people how to live well upon the land and make sure that everyone furred, feathered, finned, and two-legged cooperated with one another so that everyone could live well together. And he's sort of the hero of the Abenaki people. He teaches them lessons. He plays tricks on them to teach them lessons sometimes. And over the generations, as he's taught everyone everything they can pretty much learn, he decided he was going to retire. And he took his grandmother, who's such a good cook, his Nugami, and um, disappeared from the land where he's in retirement. You'll hear some people refer to him as... Gluskop or Gluskabe. Gluskabe is actually a past tense version of the name Gluskomba, um, meaning he has been but is no longer. I prefer Gluskomba because it's the present tense and he's still here. He's still out there. Right. He's still a being in existence mm. than something of the past. To I don't like the idea of him being a historic relic. He's such a dynamic character in the Abenaki history and pantheon of stories um, that I think it's important to keep him alive. Greetings! I'm Ben Gray. I'm the president of NELSA, the Native American Law Student Association at Vermont Law School. I'm here reading a story as told by Carolyn Black Hunt. We are at the Kowasik of the Kowas Community Gardens, the tribal gardens here in Vermont. The name of the story is Athaban and the Two Blind Men. In the not so long ago time, there was a large village of the people. This village was located on the western shore of a large lake. In this village lived two old men each one living with their own families. These men were both quite old, having lived for many winters. And in their old age, the eyes of each had become clouded by time. Neither of these two old men could see the world through their eyes any longer. While these two old men knew each other, they were not what you would call close friends. But they did have a good friend in common who would always stop by to see them when he was traveling nearby. This friend was Gluskomba, he who has made himself. And one day, Gluskomba found himself near the place of this village and came to visit, for he had news for the people. Gluskomba arrived to this village one bright morning. But when he arrived, he went straight to the Sagamon, the leader of the people. He said to the Sagamon, I have news for your village. It has come to my ears that some warriors of the enemy are coming this way. The Sagamon was not happy to hear this news, but was grateful that Gluskumba had brought the warning. So the Sagamon called the people together to share this news with them. As there were many women and children and old ones in this village, it was decided that they would not fight. It was decided that the families would each split apart and disappear into into the surrounding forests and mountains until the enemy was gone. Then they would reassemble back at the lake. However, the families of the two old men were in great despair. While they dearly loved their old ones, these two would slow the families down considerably as they must travel quickly and far. 
Gluskamba heard of their worries and called the two families to him. Fear not, he said to them. You do not need to bring these two grandfathers with you. I know a place on this lake where they will be safe until you return. I myself will check on them and make sure they have plenty to eat until you can reunite. The families were very grateful to hear these words. In the morning, the families met Gluskamba on the shores of the great lake with their canoes. With them, they brought the two old men and all that each man owned and would need. The canoes were loaded up and the men of the families paddled after Gluskamba's great stone canoe out into the lake. They paddled behind Gluskamba until a grandfather's son was high in the sky. Gluskamba led them into a cove that was hidden from view. This cove, once entered, opened into a wide pool that lapped gently against a small sandy beach. It was here that the men brought the two old ones. Gluskamba helped the men to build a large wigwam for the two old men to live in. They collected much wood for these two to have fire whenever they needed. The personal possessions were set up inside to be an easy reach for the blind hands that would need them. Gluskomba placed a large birch bark bucket outside their door for water. And finally, before leaving, he ran a thin rope from the door of the wigwam down the gentle path to the sandy beach, tying the end to a tree growing on the water's edge. In this way, the two old ones could find their way to the lake for water each day. Then, Gluskamba reached into his special bag that was never full and placed out several large bundles of food. These he attached to the rafters of the wigwam. Here is enough for food to last you for half a moon. I will return before you run out and bring you more. Then Gluskamba and the men said their goodbyes to the old ones as they returned to the village to help their families to hide. Now, these two old men had never lived without their families before, and while they knew each other, they were not close friends. It took several days for them to become comfortable with each other and their new home and to work out how to do the things that needed to be done without bumping into each other. But soon enough, a routine was established, and the two blind men became familiar with their new way of life. One night, by the light of the Grandmother Moon, there was a creature ambling aimlessly through the forest. As usual, he had no particular goal or place in mind and was just seeing what there was to see as he traveled the land. But this creature was known as a mischief maker, and others were not always so happy to see him coming. The one I speak about is Athaban, the raccoon. But he did not look them did not look then as we know him to be. Athaban was tall and, and a slender fellow with silvery gray fur. He did not have black markings as he does now, and although he loved to make mischief, Athaban was a handsome fellow indeed. And so, on this particular night, Athaban was wandering about near the shore of the lake when he happened to come upon a lone wigwam sitting in a clearing in the forest. Well, what have we here? Athaban thought to himself. There has never been a wigwam here before. I wonder who is living in this quiet place all by themselves. Athaban crept closer, taking a good look around. He saw a large pile of firewood neatly sized and stacked just to the left-hand side of the doorway. On the ground to the left of the door was a large birch bark bucket. In front of the wigwam was a small fire pit. Beyond that, a narrow trail that led to the waters of the lake. Athaban came close to the wigwam's wall and pressed his ear to it. Inside, he could hear someone snoring. Why would someone live out here all by themselves, thought Athaban. I'll bet whoever it is is lonely. I'll knock and provide this person with some good company. 
And as Athaban approached the door with his fist raised, he found his way was blocked by a thin rope tied to a sapling growing right next to the door. What is this? Athaban said to himself. I've never seen this before. He put his hand on it. He ran his hand, hand down its length. Soon it led him to another small tree at the edge of the clearing. The rope wound around it and disappeared down the trail. My, this is curious, Athaban thought. And being the curious sort, he followed that thin rope along the little path all the way to the last little sapling it was tied to, ending his journey at the water's edge, right next to the little sandy beach. Now this is very curious. I wonder why someone would tie a rope like this. Athaban followed the rope back up to the wigwam. This is most peculiar, thought Athaban. I think I'll wait till morning to see what this person does with this rope. And so thinking, he found a soft place to sit just a few yards away from the wigwam. Settling down in the moss and ferns, he fell asleep until the first light from Grandfather Sun woke him. Anxiously, he sat, waiting for the person who lived in this wigwam to awaken. Soon enough, the snoring stopped. Athaban could hear the sounds of someone slowly moving around inside the wigwam. Athaban stood up and moved closer to the door. He was eager to meet this mysterious and curious person. Shortly, the door of the wigwam opened and a man stepped out. He turned to the right and looking right past Athaban, he picked up the birch bark bucket. Then he placed his hand upon the thin rope and began to follow it from the clearing and into the forest. Athaban was surprised. This man had looked right at him, but acted as if he had not seen Athaban standing there, ready to greet him with a big smile. No one had ever done this to Athaban before. How rude, thought Athaban. He didn't even speak to me. Wanting to set things right, Athaban followed this man along the trail that led to the lake. There, he saw the man reach the end of the rope. He watched as the man carefully dipped the bucket into the water. He watched as the man tested its weight. He watched as the man turned around and followed the rope back up the trail. He watched as this man walked right past him, no, not even glancing in his direction. Athaban had never been treated in such an impolite manner. While sometimes others had tried to ignore him, some very successfully, Athaban had never before been treated like he was not there at all. This would not do. Athaban ran ahead of the man and waited for his arrival, right beside the man's front door. He, passed a great bit, he pasted a great big smile on his face and opened his arms wide to greet this man as a new friend. The man came into the clearing and did not even react to Athaban standing next to his door. He walked across the clearing with no words of greeting for the raccoon. And as Athaban stared at this man in wonderment, the man stepped right past him and went into his wigwam as if Athaban did not even exist. But in the growing light of morning, Athaban noticed something about the man when he walked close past. He noticed the man's eyes had no color. They were as white as the snows in winter. Athaban had never seen anyone with eyes like those before, and he became very curious indeed. As the man went into the wigwam, Athaban also heard the sounds of a second person moving about inside. Then he heard two voices, both male, and the voices sounded old. They made the grumbling sounds that old men make in the morning as they prepare to start their day. More curious than ever, Athaban decided to sit off to the side and watch these two men today. He sat in the deep ferns where he would not be seen, but where he could see them. And he sat there all day long, watching those two old men come and go from their wigwam. He watched as they went about their morning routines of starting a fire and having breakfast. He watched as they worked on projects all morning long, never turning their eyes to their work. Not even once. And then Athaban knew. He now understood that the first man had walked right past him because the man could not see. He now understood the old man was blind. His eyes clouded into uselessness. 
and the second old man, his, his eyes just the same. How came these two old men, who could not see, to be living alone together in the forest with no families to take care of them? How did they gather firewood for themselves? How did they hunt animals and catch birds for food? How did they find nuts and berries to eat at all? How would they know if someone had come to visit them? Oh, thought Ozabon, I think that I, have some f I can have some fun with these two old ones with useless eyes. And so thinking, Ozabon watched them all day, taking note of who did what and when it was done. He never moved from his hiding place all day, and the two men never knew they were being watched. Finally, night came and the old ones went to bed. Athaban settled down in his hiding place to sleep as well, but not until he knew that the old ones were sound asleep. He could tell by their snoring, and before going to bed himself, he did one last thing. Very quietly, he came forth and went to the rope tied next to the wigwam. Quietly, he followed it to the lake. Once there, he untied the end of that rope and creeping across the sandy beach, tied it to another tree. Then he returned to his hiding place, made himself comfortable and slept the sleep of the innocent. In the morning, Athaban was awakened before the two old men. He listened as the first man awoke. He watched as he came from the wigwam, picked up his bucket, went to the lake, returned and went back inside. The first man placed the water bucket next to the small fire that the second man was bringing back to life. Here is your water, said the first man. Ah, good, said the second. Then he dipped his hand into the bucket to splash the cold water on his face as he did every morning. But this time, he got sand. What is this, yelled the second man. Some sort of joke? Did you get lost on the way to the lake? I told you never take your hand off that rope. What are you hollering about? asked the first man, confused. I got you your water, just like I do every morning. What did you do? Miss the bucket and scoop up off our floor? Don't be stupid, growled the second man. I know right where that bucket is. And he knocked on its side to prove he did. Did you get lost, and were you too lazy to go get water, thinking that I would not notice? What are you talking about, said the first man. I brought you water just like I do every day. You probably just missed it. Here is your water. And he stuck his hand into the bucket to splash the second man, except his hand was filled with sand. Oh, creator, yelled the first man. The lake has gone dry. What? said the second man. How could that lake, that big lake go dry overnight? Why don't you admit that you got lost? But I didn't get lost. I followed the rope to the lake like I do every morning. Where did that sand come from if there is still water in the lake? You are stupid, stupid and lazy, said the second man. Give me that bucket. I'll go get the water and prove to you that the lake didn't go dry. And he grabbed the bucket and made for the door. Az Athaban had been outside the door, listening the entire time. He had his mouth covered, hard to stifle his laughter. Oh, such fun these two blind men are, Athaban thought. Then he heard the second man coming. Quick as a fox, Athaban ran down the trail ahead of him. When he got to the lake, he hastily untied the rope and moved it back to the tree it was first tied to. Then he stepped aside and waited for the second man to arrive. It didn't take long. The second man appeared, grumbling under his breath. He went to the end of the rope. Then using his foot, he found the edge of the water. Carefully, he dumped out the sand. Then he dipped the bucket into the water. He swished it around to rinse the bucket and dumped it out. Then he leaned way over and filled the bucket with water, still grumbling. He made his way back up to the trail to the wigwam. Athaban, Athaban followed silently behind, anxious to see what happens next. The second man went into the wigwam and said, Here is your water. The next time you don't want to walk to the lake, just say so. Don't pretend to be so stupid. 
This comment set off another long argument between the two old men. Athaban just sat just outside their door, listening to every word, his sides heaving with silent laughter. He listened to them mumble and grumble at each other the remainder of the morning, through lunch and into the afternoon. They groused at one another until it was time for their afternoon nap. By now, Athaban was also tired. His sides ached from laughing and giggling to himself all day long. Once the men were safely snoring, he snuck into the wigwam and curled up off to one side, dozing in the warmth of the fire. As Grandfather Sun was getting low in the sky, the two old men slowly woke up. The second blind man went outside. He counted his steps to the woodpile, picked up a few pieces of wood, and counted his steps back to the wigwam door. As he renewed the fire, the first man pulled four pieces of deer steak from a bag hanging in the rafters. Carefully, he placed these steaks on the flat stones around the fire to cook. Soon the wigwam was full of warm air that smelled like roasted meat. As the stomachs of the old men growled in anticipation, they didn't notice the sound of a third stomach also growling. Soon the steaks were cooked. Each man took his knife and speared a steak. They ate their dinner noisily with lots of smacking. Each man had a few teeth left. Only the sounds of eating and chewing could be heard over the crackle of the fire. The second man was finished with his steak first. He reached out with his knife to spear his second steak. Clunk, clunk. All he heard was the sound of his knife hitting empty stone. Clunk, clunk, clunk. Where was his steak? Why, you old pig, shouted the first man. First you play a trick on me with the water. Now you've eaten all my dinner. What are you trying to do anyway? Huh? Said the second man, eating the last of his own steak. What do you mean? How can I have eaten my steak and yours too, when you are always finished first because I have less teeth than you? Did you stick your knife in the wrong place and blame me for your mistake? Don't be ridiculous. I know exactly what I'm doing. My second steak is gone and you ate it. I think you just missed your rock. Try again, you old grump. So saying, the first man also reached out with his own knife in search of the rest of his dinner. Clunk, 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 clunk. Hey, you old rascal, you ate my dinner. What are you trying to do, to fool me? Why did he eat my second steak? Now I'll be hungry all night long. That was the last of it, too. I didn't eat your steak, shouted the second man. You ate mine and both of yours. And so the two old men sat about arguing and accusing one another again. Their voices were loud, their words became harsh, so much noise did they make that they did not hear a third mouth smacking happily on roasted deer steak. They did not hear chuckles coming from the side of the wigwam. Instead, their voices grew louder still. Someone else also knew that his was the last of the meat that the two old men had been left with. And this person was making his way there with more food. And as this person approached the wigwams, he could hear loud voices coming from inside. The voices were angry and were saying hard words. So loud were these words that no one inside the wigwam was aware that this person was standing right outside the door. Gluskamba, surprised to hear the men using such harsh words at one another, dropped the fresh deer he carried outside the door and burst into the wigwam. What is going on in here? Why are you saying such evil things to one another? Gluskamba's huge voice drowned out all this other sound. Looking about, Gluskamba's eyes landed on Athaban, his face covered with the grease of the steaks he had just been eating. Before Athaban could even react, Gluskamba's hand shot out and he grabbed that raccoon right by the scruff of his neck. Picking him up into the air, he gave Athaban a good shake. Here is the source of your fight, said Gluskamba. Athaban, the raccoon, has played a trick on you and eaten both your dinners. Turning to Athaban, Gluskamba could hardly contain his anger.
What shall we do with you, troublemaker? Glooskamba asked Athaban. You have been very naughty and disrespectful here today. As such, you must be punished for your selfish ways. So saying, Glooskamba reached down into the fire pit and picked up old coal. Without hesitating, Glooskamba drew black circles around Athaban's eyes, so that you will always remember that you should treat the old ones with respect, especially those who cannot see. It is your responsibility to help them, to make things easier for them, not to torment them. Athaban tried to rub off the charcoal, but his greasy hands just spread the circles more completely around his eyes. Glooskomba then tossed Athaban into the air and grabbed him by his tail. As Athaban hung upside down in his grasp, Glooskomba said, And so, when you try to sneak away, I will mark your tail so that everyone will always know that it is you who is sneaking. As Glooskomba spoke, he drew several circles around Athaban's beautiful silver tail. Then he let Athaban go, dropping him to the ground. Well, said Glooskumba, what have you got to say for yourself? But Athaban just stood up, dusted himself off. Then he went over to the water bucket and looked at the reflection of his new face, smoothing down his fur. Athaban said, Glooskumba, I want to thank you for my new look. I think I look rather rakish this way. As for your two blind friends over there, well, if they had respect for one another, they would not have been so quick to blame one another for the things that I have done. If they had respect for one another, they would never use such words that was at one another. And so saying, Athaban lifted his chin and sauntered out of the door. Oh, my name is Rick Hunt. I'm Carolyn's husband. And Carolyn has been a storyteller in the Native community for many, many, many years. And together we were known as Laughing Couple. And we performed um, in colleges, elementary schools, powwows, conferences, you name it. We, we were there, all um, different kinds of venues. Um, and of course, Carolyn had a stroke about three, three and a half years ago. So we have slowed down considerably doing storytelling. Uh, Carolyn has, um, she experiences what's known as aphasia, which affects her language abilities, not her intellect, but um, word search and being able to pronounce words sometimes orally and, um, so it's been a real challenge for her. And I have to say um, that she is remarkable in her um, ongoing recovery from this. Um, but Hello, I'm Ben Gray. I am uh, president of the Native American Law Student Association at Vermont Law School. And I am Robert Turner, and I, the, I am the vice president of the Native American Law Association, Student Association at Vermont Law School. And we're here today from the uh, COASEC of the COAS Community Gardens in lovely Braintree, Vermont. Uh, we've been here doing traditional storytelling, um, hearing traditional Abenaki stories as told by Carolyn Black Hunt. Uh, what we're involved with at NELSA uh, is promoting indigenous issues, particularly um, legal issues, but any type of Native American issues. Uh, this is a national organization. Um, it's been about 50 years uh, that NELSA has been around. Um, some of the things our local chapter has going on uh, is this November, we're hosting a land back 5k walk run fundraiser and we're going to be raising money for the COASEC of the COAS um, community to hopefully be able to purchase land back to have a tribal land base. Uh, so that's one of the events we're working on and, and we're also working on a um, uh, a screening of the movie Dawnland which is about the um, 
the, the foster care system in Maine and how it has um, uh, was used to take Native children away from their families. Uh, and Don Land is an amazing documentary uh, about the truth and reconciliation process that the state of Maine put in place. It's the first one of its kind in the nation, uh, and it's absolutely something worth taking a look at. Um, do you have anything you wanted to add, Robert? Well, on um, those topics that Ben just addressed, um, we are definitely um, seeking to really promote um, indigenous pe people issues. Um, one of the aspects that we are definitely looking forward to is perhaps continuing the conversation of how important the environment is. And more importantly, how important it has always been in particular to indigenous people. Throughout history, um, perhaps many things have been lost in time, but those connections that we make are never lost. This is why Ben and I are here today. It, also with the connection that we've made, and we're trying to also you know, promote that. Um, as we look around, the country is beautiful. We're in a beautiful location. The scenery is unbelievable. There's not too many places like this anymore. This is why we really need to focus on trying to protect the environment as best we can in a way to where we all can have a voice and have a place. So through our organization, we hope that we can continue to try to promote many of these issues. And with um, Ben's assistance and um, our relationship just with the community that we're looking to strengthen, perhaps we can make an impact during our time. And I think that's very important to us. That was beautifully said. That was beautifully said. And we appreciate you having us today. Or yes. having me. Ben's we been here. <laughs> he's been here many times. So well, I definitely appreciate um, the invitation and I look forward to returning. I do too. Thank you.